So, as advertised, my name is Sam and I am a strategist. Now, my particular area of expertise is in competitive strategy, but I work for an organisation that specialises in taking all of the tools made available to us by technology and using those to realise and bring to life some really incredible and compelling experiences. Now, given the nature of my theme today around humanity and technology, it's really tempting to dwell in medical application of technology. But I think all of the speakers before me have done a very apt job of that. I'm never going to be able to compete with a guy who literally has an antenna embedded in his skull. So instead, I wanted to talk to you about uh, some of the hidden ways that we're seeing technology kind of really bringing humanity to life, if you'll pardon the oxymoron. Now, we have a very rich history when it comes to speculating about what robotics and technology are going to do when they're fused with humans. Uh, everything from the very quirky and iconic C-3PO from Star Wars through to some of the more horrifying kind of weaponized versions that you see behind me now. The other alternative is this post-apocalyptic dystopian future where the entire planet and its inhabitants are suffering from gross overpopulation, extreme polarisation of the workforce, usually some sort of energy crisis and a whole bunch of other horrible things, such that we are barely coping. Now, given all of this, it's no surprise that uh, we're not really painting a very rosy picture of where things are going. And so come to uh, 2013, when there was a study conducted in the US that surveyed around 700 uh, American jobs in the workforce and found that about 47% of those were at extreme risk of automation at some time in the near future. Now, similar studies also found kind of broadly similar uh, figures to be the case. In Britain, I think it was around 35% through to kind of the mid-50s somewhere in Asia. Now, given all of this, it's kind of interesting also to remember that if we look at history, uh, this has really not continued to be the case. In fact, in the Industrial Revolution, uh, the Luddites famously really, um, you know, speculated that their jobs were going to be ultimately destroyed by steam machines and those sorts of things. And they actually went to the extent of sabotaging the very machines that they thought were going to bring about their career demise. Of course, that's not the way things turned out, but given the way we present the world and where it might be going, it's really easy to fall victim to this naysaying and believe that that's where things are going. Now, before I get too caught up in where, it's, where everything is headed, I wanted to present you with this thought. It's the idea that the greatest need that we have as humans is to fundamentally be understood. The genuine irony, then, is that we make it incredibly difficult. And in my line of work, we talk a lot about this trifecta. It's fascinating, infuriating, but mostly just remarkable. The second you see it, you know it to be true. The difference between what we say, what we share, and what we actually do. Now, we've seen time and time again that not only do we present an incredibly edited version of ourselves to the world, particularly when it comes to social media, we are also incredibly bad at knowing ourselves well enough to actually communicate what it is that we want. And if that wasn't bad enough, we actually are terrible at working out what it is that other people feel and think about us. The good news is that technology is now breaking down all of these self-imposed barriers that we're putting on ourselves. Now, for a long time, marketers have broken down the population on the basis of demographics. Things like gender, race, income, sexual preference, all sorts of things, and use those to uh, create messages that they think are going to work for us. Increasingly, we're moving towards psychographics, which at a broad level is simply the ability to be able to group the population on the basis of personality. Now, there's an organization, it's a big data intelligence company called Cambridge Analytica, and they have basically worked out that with roughly 150 odd data points or interactions, and just for reference, an interaction can be as small as a like of a Facebook page or a Facebook post, they can know someone better than their friends. With 300 of these data points, 
they can know a person better than their spouse. And with 400, just 400 of these data points, they can know a person and their preferences and predict them better than the person themselves. And in fact, in 2016, when Trump won the election, it's claimed that it was this very methodology that led to his success. Another way that that data is uh, being used is uh, by an organization, it's actually a hedge fund in the US called Bridgewater. And Bridgewater have a software program that they've developed that they call uh, a, a dot contributor of some sort. And basically it allows all of their employees in real time to rate and review each other against a series of predefined criteria. Now, it sounds fairly horrible, but what the company claim this enables, because the reviews are available not just to the reviewer and to the reviewee, but to the entire organisation, is allowing individuals to better understand how they're perceived and to potentially do something with that information, but also to create this really incredible culture where people are constantly forced to say, is my opinion actually valid? Am I actually right, or is my bias and my lens through which I see the world actually changing and giving me an unfair view? So all of this information is then rolled up, and uh, the people within the organisation can see it at scale, which allows them to see how they're being interpreted over time and how that's shifting, but also of all the people around them. Now, it's important in all of this to remember that Roughly 90-odd percent of all person-to-person -person communication is often based on tone of voice and body language. Now, in real terms, that means that I can chill the hell out and I don't really have to worry about what it is I'm saying to you right now because 90% of it is how well I'm pacing up and down this stage. But realistically, uh, humans thematically use really similar uh, visual cues to help each other understand what it is that we're trying to say. Uh, this realistically means that basically uh, when, like some of all of this behaviour, whether or not I'm frowning or I stand with my hands on my hips, is something that we learn. But a whole bunch of it is actually ingrained. And this is why people who have been blind since birth still smile when they're happy and frown when they're confused. It's these consistent visual cues that machines are able to observe and then to be able to infer, as Alexandra was speaking about briefly. Uh, the interesting thing is, most of the time, humans get that. They can accurately read what the other person's trying to say. But a bunch of the time, we get it wrong. And for those of us with autism, reading those little social cues can be incredibly elusive. It can be really difficult to work out what it is another person is actually trying to say when you're only listening to the words that are coming out of their mouth. The good news is, of course, that we're now moving towards a world where computers and machines can actually remove that elusive, elusivity. We can tell without a shadow of a doubt what it is that someone really means. We're looking at a world where there's an end to miscommunication, where people who struggle with autism and similar sorts of conditions can tell universally what it is that someone else is trying to say. Now, I did mention at the beginning I'm a competitive strategist, so forgive me for a moment while I stop and think about how all of this might actually be applied in an organisational context. At one extreme, there's research to suggest that if we humanise slot machines to a certain extent, that is, do things that are really simple, like give them a name, we can actually make people gamble more. At the other end of the spectrum, there's also the ability for us to encourage or even enforce responsible gambling behaviour by preventing people from uh, taking bigger risks than they're willing or able to do so. Another possibility is ambient spaces, spaces that are able to respond to us, whether that is in a hotel or in a showroom or something else. There's also the potential of application of data at a massive scale. What would happen if we finally got rid of all unwanted product, if there was exactly the right amount of product for exactly what it was that people wanted? The waste implications alone could be substantial. 
Finally, there's the subject of blockchain. Now, blockchain on its own obviously deserves an entire conference, and I'm not going to go into it in too much detail. But for me, fundamentally, blockchain has this glorious ability to turn global economies and give them the inherent human characteristics of those tiny local communities that we once knew. We have the potential here for trust to be able to, once again, just be given, to not require faith, to not require evidence, but just to be something that we assume to be part of the environment in which we live. Now, as Patrizia put it, I am a strategist, and it sounds like she has strategic uh, application as well, because as she put it, so what? But I put it, where to from here? Uh, it's really interesting when you see all of this to think that's well and good, particularly when you go home from a conference like this and not really know what it is you're supposed to do with it all. Uh, this is a little bit of a method that we use with some of our clients that we found to be really practical, so I'm going to take you through it quite quickly now. The first is this notion of carving out some cash. It's basically an application of the Ehrenberg Mass model in a new light, where 70% of your operating budget or whatever it might be, you spend on your cash cows. The things that you know to be true, stuff that you know will get you the results because you've done your research or you know what works. Uh, the next 20% you use to wring out every last bit of goodness that you got from the 70%. You optimize the crap out of it. The last 10% then is your moonshot money. That really exciting stuff where you spend your money looking to answer one question. And that's what would it take to get not 10%, but 10 times the results we're aiming for? It doesn't matter if this is in a commercial application or something else. What would it take to get 10 times the number of organ donors that we need, rather than just 10%? The next is, as our managing director likes to say, these problems are big, so think ludicrously small. Don't try and get budget signed off for this enormous multi-million dollar project. Instead, use that 10% budget and answer this one question. What's the smallest possible thing we could do to prove or disprove the validity of this subject or of this hypothesis? because I guarantee you the answer to that question has never and will never be a $30 million CapEx project. The third, then, is to cut your losses. And this, in practical terms, simply means to not fall victim to the sunk cost fallacy. If you started a project and it looks like it's not working, for goodness sake, don't continue to throw good money after bad. Make every project continue to prove itself. Borrow from our friends in venture capital, set up gated milestones, and continue to make every project that you, every sprint that you get up, prove its value, value towards the next stage in your project. And the last one then is don't waste your time. It's so often very tempting to invest too early and too much in a technology or a concept that doesn't yet have weight and that isn't yet actually proven or your users actually aren't using, your customers aren't working with or whatever it might be. So be careful at what point you do it and again, always test where it is you're going. Now, before I finish up, I wanted to leave you with this one thought. Computers are inherently brainless. And what I mean by this is they can only ever do exactly what they've been told to do by us. They are, however, covered in the fingerprints of the technologists, engineers, architects, and developers that have had a part in making them. And so in that way, they are arguably more human than any of us will ever be. They're the sum of our existence and of all of our intent in a way that humans just don't have the capacity to be. That's all from me. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Thanks, Sam.